The first uh, speaker will be Professor Vasil Volodymyrovich Lavny from the Ukrainian National Forestry University in Lviv and ask him to present about their efforts in close to nature forestry. Please, Vasil. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, uh, dear colleagues. Uh, first of all, I uh, uh, introduce uh, short uh, my university is uh, the only one university in Ukraine which uh, trains professionals for all specialties of forest sector with approximately 3,200 students. There are 28 departments with uh, more than 370 lecturers and uh, scientists working. It is a main uh, building uh, for teaching. Uh, we have also a green territory. You can see uh, botanical garden with, uh, with the main building, uh, 15 hectares uh, be, uh, big botanical garden. The university comprises following institutes and units, uh, forestry, ecological economics and management, forest engineering and mechanics, wood processing technology, unit for contemporary studies and post-diploma training, uh, scientific technical library, small forest academy, technological college, uh, natural reserve, Rostocha, stretch education, forestry enterprise, and another units. The motto of uh, the Ukrainian National Forestry University is uh, learning to live in her harmony with nature. Is actively implemented in practice uh, during the training students of all bachelor's and master's programs, but each program has different valued experience. For example, the students of the forestry program BSC, MSC, learn how to apply the theoretical and practical principles of uh, the close to nature silviculture. Close to nature silviculture is aimed at maximum use of natural processes of growth, development and interaction of tree species in order to form mixed uh, different ages, uh, highly productive, healthy and economically valuable forest sense with minimal financial costs. The theory of such kind of forestry is based on the following principles. One, formation of mixed and different age stands. This reduces the possible climate change risks and in the future or the economic situation at the market. For example, periodic fluctuations in wood prices of different species. Uh, two, increasing the biological stability of stands due to the formation of well-developed crowns from a young age and removal during the next reception of felling of diseased or damaged trees. Third, use of local uh, wood species in accordance with existing forest types. Four, ensure, ensuring constant natural regeneration of tree species in forest stands. Five, refusal of clear-cut felling. Instead, a selective forest management system should be used. Six, growing and selling large wood assortments of high quality. Seven, maintaining the natural fertility of soils without mineral fertilizers. Eight, the use of environmentally friendly methods of logging through the use of modern conservation machines and technologies. Nine, ensuring the biodiversity of flora and fauna by preserving rare habitats and living deep wood in forest. Ten, the use of the process of natural selection and differentiation of tree during the removal of trees for intermediate felling. 11. The formation of a diverse vertical and horizontal structure of the stand 
for example, the growth of trees of different species and different diameters and heights. Primal, uh, primal forests of the Ukrainian Carpathians uh, are a valuable natural model for close to nature forestry. Observations of the natural processes of virgin forest development allow to obtain a useful guidelines for forest management in commercial forests. That is why forester practitioners and students from Germany, Switzerland, and other European countries come uh, here every year for field studies and internships. Foresters from many countries, uh, while getting acquainted uh, with the virgin forests of the Ukrainian Carpathians, are getting inspiration and encouragement to conduct a close to nature forestry in their state, municipal or private forest. Moreover, they also invite new students and interns to study this treasure of nature. You can see some picture of a forester from uh, Germany in uh, Ukrainian Carpathians uh, uh, in uh, Uholka uh, forest uh, district from Carpathian Biosphere Reserve. We have a big virgin forest. Uh, this one is 10,000 hectare big. Uh, also come students uh, from Eberswalde University of Applied Sciences, uh, from uh, Freising, Rothenburg, uh, Switzerland, uh, to visit uh, this virgin forest. In recent years, uh, the interest of well-known international research institutions in joint research of virgin forests in the Ukrainian Carpathians has been growing. An example of such scientific cooperation is the implementation of the Swiss-Ukrainian scientific project on statistical inventory of the Uholka Sherokolushansky Beach Virgin Forest, which was carried out in 2009-2010 and repeatedly in last year. Until now, in the Virgin Forests of Europe, Studies of that structure have been conducted only on small test plots. A systematic inventory of such a large area of beach virgin land has never been carried out in Europe. You can uh, see some of this uh, forest district uh, in south uh, on the west uh, Uholka forest district in the northeast Sheroki Luch district. Uh, and uh, green one, uh, it is a uh, 10 hectare big research plot uh, uh, from a uh, year 2000. Uh, we have conducted on this plot already for inventories. You can see some uh, stand characteristics uh, on uh, this uh, 10 hectare plot uh, from year 2010 in comparison with main inventory of uh, 10,000 hectare of virgin forests. The tree density was uh, 465 uh, uh, trees per hectare, basal area 37 square meter per hectare, and uh, in volume uh, 582 cubic meter per hectare, this is much for beach forests. It was also uh, many deep wood. Uh, for example, uh, 160, uh, 10,000 hectare and uh, 171 on 10 hectare plot. More uh, detail, you can uh, read it in our publication uh, from this site. It was a, a big uh, adventure. Twenty students from Germany and Ukraine worked together two months long. You can see camp in Transcarpathia. At the 
expense of the German side for 13 years in a row, I have been conducted a study tour for 16 master students of the Institute of Forestry of the Ukrainian National Forestry University in the federal states of Baden-Württemberg and Bavaria in Germany, where students uh, have been the opportunity to learn close to nature forestry. In particular, to see modern methods of multifunctional forestry in beech, spruce, oak, and mixed beech, fir, spruce forests. To get acquainted with modern nature saving technologies of timber harvesting, to visit wood processing enterprises, steel factory, and the Berchtesgaden National Park. You can see some picture from uh, these excursions. A big uh, spruce tree in uh, mountain uh, Schwarzwald, uh, uh, steel factory near Stuttgart, uh, many forest I, types I can't and discussion. Can't see the pictures. Can you see my picture? Pictures, no, just the text. Ah, I don't know why. Uh, Try to move forward. <laughs> uh, okay. Close to nature, multi purpose forestry approach is implemented in stretch training and production forestry enterprise of my university and in the state enterprise Lviv Forestry. In the framework of a joint research and development project. Transformation of pine forests to a close to nature, forest management in Ukraine, and with special consideration of resilience to fire and climate extremes such as drought, which is carried out jointly with the University of Sustainable Development Eberswalde in Germany. This enterprise does not use clear cut felling, but only a selective forestry system. Due to this, there are no clear-cut areas in its forests. Preference is given to natural regeneration of forests. In addition, foresters live to grow individual micro-settlements trees in each area, which are marked on the trunk with the letter E for environmental needs. The company's management has established the a mutually beneficial dialogue with environmental organizations and uh, local communities, so there are no conflicts during forest management. Close to nature forestry approach is an example of eco-innovation of guiding activities in a manner which is responsible for preserving the environment. It helps to improve the protective functions of the forest, including the protection of water resources and the reduction of soil erosion. In addition, this form of forestry improves the aesthetic value of forest areas, which is important in modern conditions to increase the demand of urban residents for recreation in forests. So, a short uh, all. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Vasya. Uh, we missed uh, some pictures. I don't know why, but otherwise we could follow your um, very interesting talk. Uh, why you can put uh, questions now to Vasya and why you you are thinking about that. I want to ask uh, what is the definition of a virgin forest in the Ukrainian Carpathians? It is uh, the same uh, definition as in uh, uh, UNESCO uh, and UNICEF uh, program uh, and uh, from uh, European Conference on Protection of Forests. Uh, there are forests where never uh, was used of uh, timber harvesting. There are no changes from people. Only natural processes are going.
but for how long time? Because uh, uh, in very ancient times, in medieval times, all forests were cut everywhere. Uh, no, uh, in Ukrainian Carpathians, yeah. there are many, or, uh, many areas without roads. Uh, it was not possible to cut uh, these forests in the last uh, century. Uh, at the uh, age of trees uh, uh, is uh, 500, 600 years. Uh, we have conduct uh, investigation from uh, trees uh, with chorus, chorus uh, investigation, in which uh, stance uh, some people, uh, some trees uh, was uh, 500 years old. That's great. Yeah. Thank you. Any other question from the audience, from the international audience, please? I can't see any hands raised, so I thank again uh, Vasil Lavni for this presentation. And at this moment, there are exactly 50 people present, so I will make a print screen picture to show that the attendance was uh, very high. Just a minute, I will save it and then we can continue. I save it as a picture about attendance of the conference. Sugar at conference. Okay, that was it. Uh, now we can continue. Uh, is uh, Professor Inek Rubik here? Because he would be our next speaker. Yes, I'm from, here. From Prague. So I will ask you to present your lecture to us. Professor Rubik, please. Yeah, thank you. Uh, give me a minute to set up the presentation. Sure, please. OK. Mm -hmm. I hope you can share it with us. OK, I can see it now. Yep, excellent. Thank you very much. Uh, welcome, everyone. My name is uh, Hinek Robik. I'm from Czech University of Life Sciences Prague. Uh, and today I will be talking briefly about current coronavirus crisis and impacts on food security. It is something we are uh, we are looking at uh, within our uh, university COVID-19 response team. And uh, uh, we are thinking this could be an interesting opportunity to uh, tell everyone a bit more about, uh, about it, and especially about uh, impacts and consequences uh, on food security. Uh, well, as all of you know, and uh, of course, that's the reason why our conference is virtual. So there is no slowing trend of COVID-19 outbreak throughout the world. And uh, it's uh, our aim to start putting more effort into reflecting the current crisis also with the past crisis and pandemics. Especially we believe that it's very important to uh, analyze very uh, thoroughly all past pandemics which happened and past crisis and look at the lessons we can learn from them. Uh, because uh, we need to have clear lessons from the previous crisis and they need to be assessed, reflected, and uh, where we can, uh, we should 
implement appropriate uh, solutions. This is especially in terms of uh, food security. That's something what I will be talking about uh, in this uh, presentation. I will tell you more generally, but you can uh, reflect it in your in your uh, uh, each of your country cases uh, because we are right now running uh, uh, research in in uh, multiple regions and multiple countries. And also we are developing some uh, some kind of uh, measures and recommendations which should be uh, set up in, in place. Currently, a majority of world population is under some sort of social distancing. Same for us, same for all of you uh, in order to fight the health crisis. Uh, but this is putting in risk millions of businesses, workers and uh, farmers, especially small scale farmers who's, who are in the biggest risk. Mainly those uh, what we call poorest of the poor who are under the biggest threat. So there is time to focus on what will be happening in well, post COVID-19 agriculture and uh, what are the implications for food security. Let me start a bit uh, with uh, modern agriculture, or let's say our current agriculture and COVID-19. Because uh, as uh, a lot of you will probably know, uh, main feature of modern agriculture is its complete dependence on technology and industry support, especially uh, in terms of uh, provision of fertilizers, especially nitrogen, but many others. And uh, in many regions, uh, for example, those uh, supply chains of fertilizers, uh, they, their basic provision is done from abroad. So most of the, for example, European countries, they are fully dependent on, on import of, uh, uh, of chemical fertilizers, which can be in terms of nitrogen, for example, which are doing around 60% of the yield. So uh, you can imagine what would happen if uh, if we would lose the access to some of the fertilizers which are being brought to the to the Europe from uh, from other regions, especially especially from Asia or more specifically China these days. Also, development of agricultural technologies over the last 150 years it was accelerated by growing industry and uh, it enabled a big reduction of human labor when the population is employed in the agriculture. So the numbers are continuously decreasing. Uh, for example, uh, it's less than 2% of population who, who is directly employed in the agriculture sector in countries like Europe, USA, uh, and Japan, and others. On the other hand, if we look on uh, less developed countries or let's say global south, uh, there is, it's usually around 70% or it can go up to 70%, sometimes in some countries even, even a bit more. So we need to think about contrast to this general global trend uh, where there is the need of human labor varying among different agriculture sectors. And uh, this is of course, uh, there are sectors which are more labor demanding like fruit, vegetables, uh, horticultural specialty farms, uh, where you also need to count on on seasonal, seasonal workers, uh, which caused also a huge supply chain disruptions uh, throughout the world during the during the uh, COVID-19 crisis, which we uh, experienced. So if we look on the effects on agriculture production, the modern technologies like fertilizers, pesticides, different cultivars or animal breeds, uh, new agriculture machinery and equipment. This allowed us enormous increase on effectivity in agriculture production and reduced the human labor. But uh, if you look at it on the other side, the vast majority of population has been disconnected fully from the agriculture and has very limited knowledge about importance and natural relationships in agri-food sector. That's also the reason why we are uh, starting a couple of small initiatives to learn, uh, to teach and educate people uh, how to get back uh, uh, their understanding with, with the uh, 
uh, agri-food sector and natural relationships uh, with what is produced, uh, how things can be grown, uh, what people can grow at home, how they can harvest it and work with it. Because especially in, in uh, countries of global north, let's say Europe, uh, it has been uh, significantly lost. Moreover, the functioning of the sector, it may be significant jeopardized by disruption to the agriculture supply of some necessary inputs. Uh, this was uh, this can be uh, an example on the on the fertilizer. Another thing is seasonal aspects of crop production, uh, which we need to consider when thinking about inputs which are required within a short interval in relation to some agronomic schedule. So that also happened that uh, when the uh, when the uh, crisis came and a lot of countries went under the lockdown. Uh, a lot of countries which are, which were, for example, outside of European Union and they were used to supply their, uh, mainly it was uh, berries, uh, vegetable uh, and other, let's say, more uh, added value products, which they were used to have, uh, to be selling them to European Union, they could not. And a lot of those products uh, went to the to the uh, waste or have been wasted because there was no supply chains how to get those short term living products uh, to the to the consumers. So we always have to uh, think about uh, those consequences. But let me uh, let me have a look at uh, at the historical aspect or let's revisit the history of it uh, because. With every crisis, uh, most of the steps are very similar. So that's also the reason why we are looking a lot into uh, into history, into history of pandemics and epidemics and what we can learn out of it. Uh, generally, all hunger and diseases, they, they are commonly cohabitating with, uh, with the beginning of humankind. So there is a lot of ex examples uh, from the beginning of, of, of written evidences which we can look at. So, uh, of course, the, the impacts have been intensified when agricultural societies emerged and human population expanded. Uh, and uh, there was a big change when, uh, when, uh, for, when we went from hunting and gathering or pasturing to agriculture. And uh, during that time, uh, more of, a, more of a hunger and dis diseases issues and pandemics started to be uh, Common, common part of our history. Uh, during a relatively short period of, of time, uh, when you have a reliable source of food at disposal and uh, new methods of storage, it helped to increase the probability of survival, mostly in, in, in the winters of, uh, that's what, what as the Central Europe, because people started to gathering uh, gathering supplies and they were able to survive longer periods, even with some uh, kind of external uh, impact. Uh, if we continue with it, another another thing which we can learn a lot uh, from is different wars and endeavors of, of societies, because uh, that's often is resulting in deaths, hunger and epidemics. Uh, because uh, also what we should not forget and be prepared, I don't want to scare, but we have to always think about it, that uh, most cases of, of hunger in the past, they were related to the impacts of climatic changes or climate change. Uh, because even local and relatively short in time change of weather was able to decrease yields to such level that the local population were exposed to the famine. And we have so many cases of, of that and uh, uh, there is commonly at least one uh, large uh, volcano eruption every hundred years. We haven't experienced any larger one so far. So we have to count with this as well. Because for example, uh, medium scale eruption in in Asia, Southeast Asia, uh, for example, Indonesia would, would have uh, significant effects even for agriculture uh, here because uh, it creates the changes in weather, it creates the decrease of, of sunlight and uh, we have to uh, count with 
all the possibilities. That's what we need to think about. Also, as agriculture evolved and with uh, uh, bettering the farming procedures, the plants achieved the, the limits of their natural possibilities. So, of course, there, there uh, was different kind of uh, improvements in plants, in procedures, uh, which are, which are um, helping plants to get used to the droughts, frost or wet seasons, but it will or it would not work in, in a terms of larger scale change, which could happen uh, in a shorter period of time. So now, for example, talking about any kind of, of volcanic eruption. So what does uh, history says to us? Uh, under such situation, only one year with significant weather divergence or di weather change from normality, uh, it was always enough to start a series of events resulting in hunger. And uh, when we did some some uh, basic calculations, it would be still very similar uh, these days, because if, uh, for example, uh, global north would be uh, affected uh, strongly, then there would not be possible to resupply from different different continents. Also, the water reservoirs, they were uh, very commonly depleted. Uh, Herds were slaughtered and many of farms were, were abandoned. This was happening in the in the past, of course. Uh, now we can be more prepared to that. We are living in different kind of society, uh, but we always need to think about uh, so social implications of potential weather crisis, which can be like another step to the, to the current crisis. Uh, because we already know what always was happening, so we have more opportunities how to uh, get ready for that. But let's get back to the future. Uh, I mean the present. And let's have a look to some main implication from the crisis for food production. So something uh, what what is happening uh, now and what, what will be happening uh, in the in the current times. Because we need to look at the sustainability, security and stability of food supply, democratic decision making, fair incomes for both providers and consumers, uh, because especially this we need to, to help ensure in the time of current uh, crisis and post pandemic uh, food system. Uh, agriculture generally uh, has two main aspects, that's of course supply and demand for food. And both of them are very related to the food security. So, uh, and both of them have been affected uh, by the crisis quite significantly. So, um, that's posing the food security also at a, at a risk. So, what, what can be expected now even more uh, in response to the current crisis that uh, farmers will have to uh, try to look for more. Res resilient business models because uh, a lot of them have uh, their supply chains were not strong enough to, to survive these these changes a lot of uh, farmers had or uh, farmer enterprises uh, either went off business or are at the uh, at the edge of it also uh, there is very strong focus on improving the farm to table or farm to fork trend, uh, which is accelerating worldwide. There is a big number of initiatives in uh, European Union to, to focus on that and shorter the supply chains, which is uh, one of the main ways what we have to focus on and what we have to encourage. Also, the producers expect to add more value to, to their production to make to make it more resilient and both at a small and large scale, uh, because this is one of the way, especially uh, prolonging the, the long shell or long life of, of the of the food products, uh, because that's very important. Uh, it was an interesting uh, interesting case in in Italy, for example, uh, where a lot of milk production is commonly uh, supplied to the farmers market, so people are used to the uh, fresh milk, uh, which is not uh, fully pasteurized and it doesn't stay very long time. And because the most of those food markets were, were closed, uh, 
also the farmers, uh, dairy farmers, they had no way how to sell their milk, so a lot of it had been have been wasted, which was, for example, not the case in countries like Czech Republic because here is very rare to to be selling a, a fresh milk, uh, but in countries where it is more common, they all uh, had uh, the similar similar issues. So those are a couple couple of things. Also. Uh, it has to continue um, to support investing in critical technologies, uh, which uh, which would help uh, to tackle the challenges and be more flexible in the future. A lot of lot of it, uh, and I believe that it's happening in most of the uh, European countries right now. A lot of support goes to different digital solutions, so to be able also to. Uh, in an easy way or in the shortest possible way to supply from the producer to the final consumer. Uh, also, uh, there will uh, this will have to necessarily happen also in developing countries where more added value will need to be added to the production uh, because uh, that's one of the ways to make it more uh, uh, able to survive. Also, uh, what it will be even more necessary is to ensure more of a food safety uh, because we need to focus on traceability tools to establish various optimization opportunities, sustainability impacts, and chain chain of custody because that's necessary when we want to uh, have some traceability tools in in place. Also, as it was in in past. Production, especially large scale production, has to be more flexible and has to be willing to be optimized and and we have to uh, more modernize the supply chain because that's something what we can learn, especially from uh, from the times of, of wars, for example, that production has to be very flexible uh, and be able to to change their uh, production chains and how the things are, are produced. Uh, for example, uh, nice examples are uh, different kind of facilities which change their production from what they were making uh, to, for example, producing face masks or face respirators. Uh, we have a couple of technological companies which were able to very, in very short way, develop their own solutions and their own face masks or face respirators and certify them and get them to the market in a very short time. So in some of the uh, in some of the sectors it works in some of them uh, it needs more more support to, to make them more flexible. And of course uh, we need to think about uh, further support of acceleration of digital agriculture, uh, various uh, digital tools, artificial intelligence uh, which uh, can help farmers to uh, reduce the number of, for example, pesticides they are using in, in terms of uh, in terms of some predictive predictive tools and uh, save them uh, money, save them uh, pesticides or another or or the other uh, potentially also of course fuel. So uh, more of a digital agriculture is something what uh, what has to be for the more uh, supported. So what more can be expected, just to briefly conclude, uh, we are observing and we see and uh, we know that uh, there will be changes in jobs in the agriculture. Uh, that's especially uh, concerning the, the seasonal workers, uh, because uh, in a lot of countries we could we could see that, especially during the uh, lockdowns, that uh, this changed significantly and in some sectors, in some agriculture sectors, it was quite problematic. So uh, this is uh, where, where we can expect uh, more changes. Uh, as we know, based on uh, based on uh, some research among among Czech farmers, uh, there is more uh, expected shift to to robotics. So most of the farmers uh, here in Central Europe they are expecting to to uh, become less 
reliant on the on the uh, labor and try to invest even more into robotizing their their production and harvesting etc another thing is changes in line speeds that means uh, especially uh, less focus on the on the speed but more focus on uh, long life or long shelf uh, of, of, of the food produced in the in the lines also flexibility that that's uh, quite connected flexibility in the industry uh, because most of the industries learned it the hard way that they need to be more flexible because uh, they were not uh, expecting or they were not used to any kind of sudden change like like this and of course uh, we are uh, looking uh, right now closely at the long-term effects uh, which will bring a uh, number of producers out of business but also we can uh, we can see some initial trends of accelerating of foreign investments from other countries into uh, in, into agriculture sector of some affected countries and a lot of uh, structural changes in, in agriculture and, and uh, general food security. But as always, with changes and challenges, there are coming a lot of opportunities and possibilities. And uh, that's the reason why we are and we have to be uh, very optimistic. So thank you for your attention. Uh, it was it was my pleasure. And uh, now I'm I would be uh, happy for any kind of remarks, questions, or, or comments. Uh, hello, can you hear me? Yes, yes. Uh, I have uh, like uh, I want to clear one thing out. I need your opinion about it. So one thing that I learned in COVID-19 is uh, the basic thing is uh, your immune system. How good is your immune system and how can you fight this disease and stuff like whatever it is. So about your mentioning about the agriculture improvements and stuff. So I'm a normal bioscientist student like uh, bio biology is my major. And I've been told that there's like water cycle when water comes there. You use pesticides, you use fertilizers. They have some uh, minerals and substances that can be harmful for your own health. And this whole thing like, you know, we should limit the use of fertilizers or we should uh, improve them. So so that like our food would be much more better because what we consume, uh, they further decide how strong is our immune system going to be. So, what's with the situation with Prague and the whole European Union? Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for the question. Um, yeah, it's it's very true. Um, the thing is, well, generally, uh, we have some evidences that some of the, uh, of course, some of the pesticides and some of the uh, fertilizers they might be not beneficial for the for the health. Uh, that's for sure. Uh, but on the other hand, uh, yeah, that's that's the problem that uh, majority of yields is is created to the, by the by the fertilizing. In terms of nitrogen, it would be around sixty percent. So, uh, if you would stop, for example, if you would do a full shift to the uh, to like uh, not using the current fertilizers, let's say chemical fertilizers. We would have the full reduction by by 60% of yields, so that would not be feasible. But of course, on the other hand, we could, we or we should even uh, focus on more organic way of fertilizers. Uh, that's, for example, very nice, uh, uh, very nice example is is from uh, UK during the during the World War. Uh, it was uh, quite interesting that. Uh, because they of course they lost all the all the supplies of fertilizers because majority of fertilizers back then were produced in in germany so during the world war they had no access to the uh, or on purpose uh, germany stopped exporting uh, exporting fertilizers to the countries where they were in a war or they didn't want to support so uh, what they 
did, they, they starting to explain people again that uh, um, cow manure is, is their brown gold and they need to get it back to the soil and they need to resupply uh, or, uh, organic uh, fertilizer in, in this way. So they went back a uh, couple of decades in, in a way by using, uh, try to use the organic fertilizer back on their fields and somehow uh, try to balance the, the loss of chemical fertilizers. So there, it's always uh, possible, but of course it's much more labor demanding. That's one thing. And uh, another thing is that uh, it has, we have to be producing a significant amount of, of of food to be able to, let's say, supply uh, supply the, the population. So yeah, in terms of Czech Republic, there is uh, more shift to uh, different types of, of uh, environmental friendly fertilizers. Uh, uh, even uh, actually in comparison with other neighboring countries, there is like a, a lesser use of, of uh, uh, chemical fertilizers on average than, than in other countries, but we would still not be able to 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 uh, uh, to work without it. So uh, that's the thing. So it has to be in in balance, and the shift has to uh, to come. But uh, we need to be uh, prepared. For example, what what we also looked at is that uh, if we would be able to. Um, use, for example, uh, fertilizers uh, from units which are right now coming to for the energy purposes. So that's different kind of uh, animal manure, but also a lot of energy crops which are uh, which are uh, now uh, planted just for purposes of of generating electricity. So uh, we at the university we did some of the uh basic models to to look at uh, what would be possible and if the, the agriculture could work if we would uh, let's say more strongly reshape uh, reshape it uh which would work but again it would take a significant amount of, of labor and structural changes yeah thank you so we are behind schedule so we have to go on thank you for the answer to the question and uh, Let's, I turn to our next speaker, Dr. Nenad Zlatic from the University of Kragujevac and ask him to share his slideshow with us. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, again. Okay, just a minute, please. Dr. Zlatic, are you there? Yes, I'm there, just to put presentation. Okay. Please try to keep it within 20 minutes mm -hmm. just to, to finish about three o'clock okay. with, with the whole session. I'm uploading it. Uh, uh, just a moment. Okay. I have some technical issues with the network.
It's okay. I can see it now. Okay, you can see it. Can I cannot yes. see it, but it doesn't matter. Okay, I can see it now. Okay. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Nana Zlatic, and I'm a PhD student and researcher. I completed undergraduate and graduate studies of biology at the same faculty. During the course of biology, my attention was attracted by botany, and botany is on our faculty department of biology college. Uh, these departments are modern equipment and possess laboratories for physical plant physiology, morphology, etc. Uh, beside the laboratories, also, we have field studies where we are keeping in touch with nature and present to the nature to be in touch with nature and understand what's happening down there. Uh, one of the units of our department is Botanical Garden. Botanical Garden is situated near major uh, building of faculty, one kilometer from it. And uh, our botanical garden uh, present the most conventional method of ex city conservation. Uh, also, in ex city conservation, uh, protect species are necessary for breeding and reintroduction if that's possible. Uh, these facilities provide not only housing and care for specimens of endangered species, but also have an educational value. Uh, they inform the public of the treatment status of endangered species are of those factors which cause, cause uh, with the hope of creating public interest in stopping those factors with jeopardized species. Uh, genetic diversity is often lost within captive population uh, due to founder effects and substantial small population sizes. Uh, minimizing the loss of genetic diversity is an important component of ex city conservation, and it is critical for successful reintroduction and the long term success of the species. Uh, since more diverse populations have higher adaptive potential, uh, the loss of genetic uh, diver diversity due to founder effect can be minimized by ensuring that the founder population is large enough and genetically representative of the wide population. Uh, this is often difficult uh, because removing large number of, indi of individuals from the wild population may further reduce uh, the genetic diversity of the species. That is already of conservation is uh, to save a species from extinction. It is to be as a last resort or a supplement to in city conservation uh, because it cannot recreate the habitat as a whole. Uh, the entire genetic variation is be it uh, symbiotic counterparts or those elements which over time and, uh, a species adapt to changing surroundings. Instead, uh, ex city conservation reaches from its natural ecological context, preserving it under semi isolated conditions, whereby natural evolution and adaption progress are either temporarily uh, altered by introducing the specimen to a natural habitat. Uh, the downside to this is that. Uh, um, re release the species uh, may lack uh, the genetic adaptation and mutation, uh, which will ever change natural habitats. Uh, can you hear me? There is some okay. sound problem with connection. Yes, but more or less. Yes, can follow. Okay, okay. Uh, these factors combined with specific environmental needs of many species, some of which are nearly impossible to create by man, make city conservation impossible for a great number of the world's endangered flora. 
Uh, besides that, soil chemistry can play an important role in determining plant diversity. Uh, serpentinite soil are usually which limits plant diversity compared to the that on uh, non serpentine uh, the usually high concentration of toxin serpent are considered to be the deficit factor that cause low diversity and high endemism. Uh, environmental factors, especially soil fertility, soil fertility and climate, important role in determining the species. Uh, Adaptive factors accounting for much variation of species like soil pH and magnesium to place an important role in species distribution. Uh, serpentinite or ultramafic soil represents a specific substrate and it has uh, extreme chemical and physical characteristics. We cannot uh, see the slides moving on forward. Mm -hmm. so. Okay, Some, uh, somehow I, they stuck at the botanical garden slide. I have problem with it. I don't see my presentation. So if you see. can hear me, let's proceed. It's it's technical error about networks, I'm sure. Just see. It. It's stuck there. Okay, can I proceed without presentation? I can I can show you. I have your presentation. Perhaps I can show you mm -hmm. on the uh, if I can uh, okay. uh, share it. But I, you are you are free. Uh, perhaps it's to not it. possible to share two presentation. Okay, mm -hmm. I will share. I will share your presentation. It's number three. Mm -hmm. and OK, that's it. Can you see it? Yes, now I can see it. It's good slide, yes. Yes, oh. now it's good. I'm speaking about that now. OK, uh, one is. Serpentinite soil, which represents a specific substrate because it has extreme chemical and physical characteristics, disturbed mineral regime, the lack of essential nutrients like calcium, calcium, potassium, uh, uh, disturbed uh, uh, calcium to magnesium ratio, greater quantities of heavy metals like manganese, nickel, chromium, etc., and variation of pH values, which range. From, from acidic to very strong alkaline. Uh, uh, the significant physical characteristic of this type of soil are, are shallowness, skeletalness, and specific water. Uh, calcareous soil is soil that contains free calcium carbonate. This type of soil, okay, okay. Uh, uh, characteristic of arid. Uh, and semi areas, as well as humid and semi humid zones, particularly where parent material is rich in calcium. On the chemical level, the presence of calcium carbonate both includes alkaline reaction in calcareous soil and the effects of availability of natrium, calcium, ion to plants. Uh, carbonates in soil contribute to the pH buffering within the range 7.5 to 8.5. Apart from chemical influence, calcium carbonate in calcareous soil influences the physical property. Uh, uh, in order to maintain continued existence of the plants, have developed a series of anatomical, morphological, and physiological adaptations, primarily due to high concentrations of heavy metals. Uh, the genus to uh, slide ten, please. Slide ten. Slide ten. So previous. Yeah. Okay. Okay. One more previous. Previous. Ten. Okay. That's it. Uh, the genus Teucrium belongs to the family Lamiaceae, 
The Eucrimontanum is perennial, shrub-like plant with half ligneous branches up to 25 centimeters high and inhabits thermophilic calcareous rock, dry mountain meadows, and edges of forest in Europe and in Italy. The Eucrimontanum is used as an diuretic and in the treatment of digestive and respiratory diseases and possesses anti-inflammatory, antioxidant, and antimicrobial effects. Uh, next slide, please. And that's it. Uh, this research uh, for my PhD uh, encompasses the comparative analysis of the content of the metals like magnesium, nickel, ion, etc. 20 of them, but I used to show only a few of them with the biggest differences. Uh, uh, we took uh, samples of soil above ground plant parts of the Montanum from different habitats with serpentinite and calcareous substrate. Uh, conducted comparative analysis of the content of metals in the soil sample above ground plant parts from the species Eucrimontanum sampled from serpentinite and calcareous habitats indicate that the variability of their quantity depends on the soil type. Results show that the content of magnesium, iron, nickel, and manganese in soil samples from serpentinite habitat were greater in comparison to the calcium and other micro elements. Uh, analyzed plants from serpentinite habitats contain higher quantities of iron, nickel, and chromium as opposed to the plants sampled from calcareous habitats, which contain greater quantity of cal calcium and zinc. Regardless of, of observed presence of metals in the above ground plant pots, analyzed plant species cannot be declared as metal. Metal. Uh, the last slide, slide please. Last slide. Last one. Okay. Last, last one. Sorry about the connection. This is, this uh, is the last. Uh, yeah. Yes, yes, yes. That's it. Uh, given that the topic is, is sufficient explored, I decided that I should deal with it more profoundly in my PhD thesis, particularly with respect to the differences between the species growing in serpentinite and uh, limestone and calcareous habitats. Uh, the differences explored within framework of classical and geometric morphometrics would include quantity of certain secondary metabolic essential oils, concentration of metals in the substrate and anatomical and morpho morphological structure. But uh, to sum this up, uh, some plant species are seldom, if ever, found on serpentinites. Others are indifferent, meaning that they occur both on or off serpentinites, yet others are, are almost totally restricted to serpentinites. But uh, what mechanism drive the process? Our plant, plants uh, uh, somehow genetically pre-adapted to the life of the edge. Um, maybe did the selective pressure of life of serpentinized further separates these plants from others over time? Uh, is it nurture or nature? Likely both, but for now it is sufficient to say that uh, species on serpentinized is a function of serpentinized syndrome that sum of responses of physical, biological, chemical, and temporal factors. That's it. Sorry about connection. Okay. Thank you for the presentation. It was very interesting, and I apologize for these network problems, but I think at last we managed to solve it. So, um, if you have one very short question, Nanat can answer that. If no, I congratulate again on your research and in the very interesting perspectives of the further continuation of this research. Thank you, Thank you. Nana. Thank you very much, Professor. Now we turn to uh, speakers from Hungary. 
uh, Agnes Balint Mesaros from the University of Obuda is our next speaker, presenter. Please try to share your presentation. Are you there, Agnes? Are you online? Hello, anybody to present? If you are not connected, Agnes, then I ask uh, Osam Bayumi Homuda to present his paper.
I'm sorry, this time it was my computer that couldn't work properly. So I ask whether the presenters of the next two paper from Obuda University are here or not. Dr. Agnes Balint and Dr. Bayumi Hamuda. Are you there online? No. And I think uh, I will continue with my uh, presentation. Can you hear me? Can you see me? Yes. Yes? Yes. Thank you. So I don't know where these people are. Uh, let's continue with my uh, presentation. Can you see my presentation? Not yet. And now? Not yet? No. No. Always these technical problems. I try to share it again. What about it now? Now we yes, see we it. Can. You can see it. Yes. Oh, I'm greatly relieved. Then I can start. So this will be a brief introduction to European Union Horizon 2020 project which started two years ago and it's about sustainable farming and the main approach is to achieve uh, sustainability is through crop diversification and low input management techniques. The authors are um, along with me, my colleague uh, Josef Dezső and PhD student Marietta Rezsek at our University of Page. The problem is very well known to all of you, I think. It's monocropping. The FAO also recognized in various reports, this is one of the latest, that for most part of the world, Biodiverse agriculture is endangered by monoculture, so large farms are, large fields are used for a single crop, and because it's a single crop, as you see in the background, you need the application of a lot of pesticides, fertilizers, 
and also from the aspect of energy, it's uh, kind of wasting a lot of energy. And uh, just one figure, only five, only nine plant species are grown on almost two thirds of, make up almost two thirds of the agricultural production. So the most important food crops. How can this situation be amended? On a larger scale, on a, over larger areas, the whole landscape has to be diversified. There are good examples from England, Normandy, for example, this bocage a type of agriculture landscape means that uh, forest patches, hedgerows, tree lines, grasslands, and arable lands are arranged in a mosaical uh, structure. But of course, it needs uh, very large scale interventions. In, in Hungary, for example, it is uh, kind of unimaginable to uh, transform the whole landscape in uh, these dimensions so fundamentally. So crop diversification in smaller areas within agricultural fields seems to be uh, more um, feasible solution. In this report, the FAO acknowledged that uh, diversified crop cultivation reduces the risks of economic shocks. Integrating intercrops and cover crops and rotation, uh, particularly legumes, into the uh, management will uh, reduce uh, several hazards to agriculture, like drought, the loss of fertility, pest damage, and, the, and also useful for weed control. And diversified cropping produces, in addition, many additional uh, ecosystem services. The reduction of greenhouse gas emissions can be expected from that. More storage of carbon in the soil, erosion control, and increase of biodiversity, both uh, above and below ground. For this reason, this uh, Horizon 2020 project was launched. The um, full title of the project shows that it's not just uh, an agriculture and nature science, natural science project, but also covers uh, economics and social uh, benefits, social processes. So it's crop diversification and low input farming across Europe from practitioners engagement so stakeholders are included, and ecosystem services to increase revenues and value chain organization. There are altogether 26 European partners from uh, seven countries, as you can see it on this, uh, one of the meetings, picture taken in the Spanish a meeting of the project uh, three years ago, the kickoff meeting. Uh, the distribution of work is that uh, 26 case studies are designed in six pedoclimatic regions of Europe. Uh, the Pannonian uh, region may not be the biggest of them, but it's part of the accepted regionalization scheme of the European Union. So we were also included to represent this Pannonian region. The whole 
job, the whole task is subdivided into 10 work packages, um, broken down to 10 work packages, beginning from data mining, crop production and quality, biodiversity conservation, additional ecosystem services, and the economic uh, work packages include uh, value chain analysis, economic and policy assessments. I am, um, I represent the University of Page and we are responsible for mostly the ecosystem services survey and that's, that's focused on soil fertility. So there are a whole range of questions to be answered, how this uh, concentration intensification of crop production affects soil fertility, uh, what can we do against uh, land degradation, irreversible damage like uh, soil compaction, water and wind erosion, water logging, chemical changes and loss of organic matter, plus another long row of questions. The project crop diversification has a lot to do with globalization. So sustainable farming, and as we have heard, food security is foremost among the global environmental goals. We have also heard that it's closely related to climate change. It affects the international market, the trade of farm products. For example, uh, the crop we study in Hungary, asparagus, is exported to Switzerland and Sweden now. It involves a lot of PhD students in, from developing countries. And, uh, one of the partners, the Wageningen University and Research, um, includes Chinese PhD students at the University of Portsmouth, students from Bangladesh, and we in Page have students from India and Egypt. The, uh, we want to exploit the best practices, not only from the members of the project from the European countries, but also from North America and Australia. Um, advantage is that a uniform methodology for laboratory and field investigations have been elaborated in the first stage of the project, which is used by all partners. And uh, the globalization aspect also means that we believe that our res results can be used by other countries in other regions. As a physical geographer, I'm particularly happy that the project also has geographical aspects. How the ecosystem services look like in the different pedoclimatic regions of Europe. We can compare it. And also the most of the field work, the case studies take place at plot scale, but we hope to extend the findings to micro region scale. Uh, how it can be achieved, it's an important scientific problem. And also climate change, of course, it uh, closely influences, uh, controls the success of crop diversification too. So we have two case studies offered to the project from Hungary. They are quite different. Number 10 is a horticulture case study. It's about asparagus growing in the central uh, sandy, blown sand region 
of uh, Hungary. Uh, the company has a uh, good marketing strategy, uh, home and abroad. And also number 11 is a well-known, at least in Hungary, well-known enterprise, Gere Attila Winery in Villain. It's in a less country and they produce uh, high quality wines and they are also organic farmers. So there are huge differences between the management tillage techniques, partly because of the quite different crops, and between the wheat control, pesticides and uh, uh, fertilization application uh, practices. So we have designed uh, experimental fields in both case studies. There are control parcels where there is no cover crop. This is the horticultural area. Uh, all these green, dark, dark uh, gray uh, rows are asparagus rows. And between them, we have intercrops like pea and oats in a regular arrangement. In the other test area in the vineyard of uh, Attila Gere, um, we also have uh, control parsons. They are indicated in yellow here, but the interrows are uh, seeded with grass in one case and with aromatic plants, yarrow, Achillea millefolium in the other case. So these are the quite different treatments and diversifications that are uh, applied. Monitoring will last for three years and it will cover all kinds of soil properties. I don't want to uh, read them, physical, both physical and chemical. Vegetation cover um, soil life, um, earthworms, uh, weed distribution, microbiological analysis. They are now done with D DNA analyses. And we also study the product produces, the crop properties like leaf area index, stem diameter, various uh, properties of the harvested crop, um, sugar content for the grapes and so on and so on. I only have time to show you some first results. For example, the carbon and nitrogen availability we have heard is crucial for plants and particularly the ratio, the C per N ratio is important. How does it look like in the case of the uh, horticulture case study? You can see that the differences between the storage of uh, these elements is quite different. And uh, uh, we can say on the basis of the first result that uh, peas produced a better result in terms of C per N ratio than oats. To further develop the project, a cluster was formed from all those Horizon 2020 projects, which are concerned with diversification. You can see that there are altogether six uh, such projects. Of course, the emphasis is different uh, um, among the, these projects, some of them are more economic 
in their research area. Uh, some others focus on the use of legumes like uh, leg value and true, for example, but they overlap in their in their subject in their topic largely. So that uh, collaboration within this uh, cluster will um, allow us uh, further perspectives in our research. That was um, what I wanted to say. And um, of course, we are grateful for the, for the support of the European Commission and also for the Program of Excellence in Higher Education uh, for the last year. Thank you for your attention. If you have questions on this project, I'm re I try to answer them. Okay, then. <clears throat> I put the question again. Are the two other presenters from the University of Obuda are present? Can they connect and can they show us their presentation? I would be very sad if we had to miss them in this conference. But I'm afraid that is the case. The presentations are with me, so the organizers of the conference also have them. And I am sure they are ready to distribute them, send them to you if you are interested. But it's still a very sad situation that we cannot listen to the presenters to explain everything through the internet at least. So, I can't see their names among those people present. If I don't get any response, then I, I'm afraid I don't have anything else to do. I just uh, close this uh, nature sciences session. In spite of this short session, I think it was successful. We heard some news about sustainable forestry, about the adaptation of uh, plants uh, to their abiotic geological environments, that means the rocks in the mountains, and also a very topical issue, the impact of COVID-19 pandemic on agriculture and on globalization and indirectly on our whole life. Thank you for attending and I hope you enjoyed these presentations. Goodbye.
Goodbye. Good night. Goodbye. <laughs>